Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Okay. Well, thank you for this invitation and this honor to speak and here at Clemson and to deliver the George B. Hartzog Jr. Environmental Lecture. It's really an honor also to be here with many of my colleagues and my predecessors and folks that work in the park and recreation field. Each of us come to our positions with a slate full of challenges and opportunities, and I'm going to talk a bit about that. Each of us try our best to make a difference for the parks and for the country. And if I may, I'd like to take a moment to just mention the passing of, of one of our former directors, Roger Kennedy, whose services will be held here in a couple weeks. But he was a friend, a mentor, an inspiration to us in the National Park System, and, um, and a great scholar of history. And he brought a much deeper understanding to the historical parks that we have responsibility to manage. He'll, he'll be missed. George Hartzog took the helm of the National Park Service in 1964 and served until 1972. And those were some pretty tumultuous years in this country. The Vietnam War was at its height. Civil and women's rights movements were, were really fighting for equal opportunities for, for all. Baby boomers were coming of age. Americans were enjoying really unprecedented mobility across the country. And there was a new environmental awareness dawning. In a series of interviews, George articulated his three objectives as director, to expand the national park system, make the National Park Service more relevant to all American people, and to incorporate more women and minorities into the management structure. He succeeded in all three, and that is really his greatest legacy. He led the greatest expansion in the National Park System in history, and particularly redefined what National Park meant to include recreation areas and seashores, urban parks and major cities. And he created programs like Summer in the Parks that really brought inner city kids to these extraordinary places for a park experience. George named the first African American park superintendent, the first career woman superintendent, the first American Indian superintendent, and the first black chief of the US Park Police. So 50 years later, here we are. And what are those drivers that are pushing us today? The population of the United States is now more urban than ever, booked at about 60%, and probably more disconnected from nature than even in the Hartzog era. The US economy is struggling, and there's competition to see who can cut the budget the most. Political rancor and partisan bickering, I believe, is at an all-time high, certainly a high for my 35 years. And the US population is growing increasingly diverse, with an increasing number of people who have had no contact whatsoever with parks or public lands, or even knowledge that they exist. There is a growing desire for government to be more businesslike, more entrepreneurial, and there is a drumbeat for privatization of the parks that we manage. Public education in the US continues to fall behind other countries in the areas of science, history, and technology. And the impacts of climate change on our parks are increasing and evident in spite of the fact that the public's belief in climate change is declining. So considering these challenges, I've asked myself as director of the National Park Service, with the employees and the partners of the National Park System and our larger parks community, how can we help? Almost 50 years ago, George Hartzog presided over the 50th anniversary of the National Park Service. And we find ourselves on the eve of our 100th, which will be celebrated in 2016. The 100th anniversary presents a unique opportunity to not only reflect on our past success, but to take actions over the next five years, from now to 2016, to prepare for a second century of stewardship and public engagement. Now, over the last 20 or 30 years or so, there have been many reports developed by blue ribbon panels and commissions that call upon the National Park Service to step up to the mantle of responsibility that really only the NPS can carry, to invite all Americans and visitors from around the world to explore wild places and see the grandeur of the American landscape, to learn of the trials and tribulations of our great leaders, activists, scientists, authors, and artists, 
by walking in their shoes in their homes on their ground. People like Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Teddy Roosevelt, Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, Harriet Tubman, Thomas Edison, Andrew White. To openly confront the environmental challenges of our time, climate change, habitat fragmentation, the spread of exotics and the transport of international global pollution. Not by echoing the shrill voice of advocacy, but by the accurate, accurate articulation of impact shown directly on the ground in special places, like the impaired visibility over the Grand Canyon or the melting glaciers of Mount Rainier. To use our parks as classrooms to inspire young minds to the possibility of a future as a scientist, a scholar, or an educator. To assist communities to create their own green spaces, to celebrate and protect their own history as important, and to help reconnect people to rivers that have been abandoned and need restoration. To recognize that the entire parks family, national, state, regional, county, city, must work together to provide seamless services to the public at a landscape scale. Frankly, it is our job, or we have been told that it is our job, to make this grand experiment in democracy actually work and to remind all citizens of what it means to be an American. These commissions, often led by luminaries such as John Hope Franklin, Sandra Day O'Connor, E.O. Wilson, or Howard Baker, reported a constant theme. Wake the sleeping giant that is the National Park Service and help this country achieve its lofty goals to be a more perfect union, to achieve the pursuit of happiness. I have all these reports stacked neatly on a shelf in my desk in my office where they gather a little more dust each day. Now, while they are all crisp and in their clarion calls, they languished in part because, for one, they called on Congress to either provide an authorization or an appropriation. Their success was dependent upon a president or a secretary to wield his pen or his influence. Some came out at the sunset of an administration and were immediately discarded, as so many initiatives are when a new boss comes to town. And also, each document was never really adopted by the rank and file of the service itself, and without that support, they dropped off the radar. So coming in as the 18th director, I was well aware of these pitfalls. I felt we needed a second century plan that draws from the best of these recommendations, but is also informed by the voice of the public and built, embraced, and adopted by the rank and file of the NPS and our partners. It also needed to not be dependent upon the actions of Congress or the current administration. It must be designed to survive a change in administration, should there be one in 2012, since 2016 is coming regardless of who sits in the Oval Office or in the Office of the Director. So here we are in late 2011. You're probably wondering, well, what took you so long? I must admit we got off to a bit of a slow start. It took over six months to get me through confirmation in the Senate, and in that process you learn that D.C. is one tough town. I was also spent quite a bit of the following year as an incident commander on the Gulf oil spill, over three months. And that issue dominated the Department of Interior for almost the entire year and continues uh, to dominate a lot of our interest and our focus. We did, however, last year launch the America's Great Outdoors Initiative and did 50 listening sessions across the country, 20 of them with young people in particular, no one under 24 allowed into the room, so that we could hear directly from the American people about their views of America's great legacy, the great outdoors and the national parks. And what we heard is that they still love the national park system. They still love this great legacy in this land, but they are worried. They're worried about the future. So we gathered all of these comments, thousands of comments and thousands of of ideas, and together we launched a call to action preparing the NPS for a second century of stewardship and engagement. 
The call rallies our employees and our partners to advance 36 action items toward a shared vision for 2016 and beyond. You can find it on the web if you go to nps.gov and you'll see call to action. You will note that there is no ask for new money. There is no ask for new authorizations. You will note that the power to implement all of these actions is completely within the authority and power of our existing organization and its great partners, of which I include Clemson University. The call reaffirms our fundamental achievements and mission as very solid, but it also addresses change, the world's change and our change. Now, choosing 36 actions out of hundreds was probably the hardest part, but we screened them not only for those criteria that I've already listed, but also those that would be transformative to really prepare us for this next century. They address four buckets of actions, connecting people to parks, advancing the education mission, preserving America's special places, and enhancing professional and organizational excellence. I'm going to take the rest of my time to just hit on a few of these actions to give you a bit of a taste of what this is all about. Connecting people to parks. The people who have shaped this land from indigenous cultures that lived here thousands of years ago to the, to the newest immigrants have all contributed and each deserve recognition in the American narrative and within the national park system or other protected areas. The first action item we call fill in the blanks. It's a development of a comprehensive national park system plan essentially a gap analysis where we will identify the places and the stories critical to the American narrative that are not yet included. A good example of what we already have underway is that just in the last week or so we convened the American Latino Heritage Scholars Panel, a group of esteemed historians who have agreed to help put us on the path to developing and sharing the American people a fuller, richer, and truer history and culture of the 50 million American Latinos. Their work will recommend new national parks, national historic landmarks, listings in the National Register, and new layers of history at existing sites. For example, recently developed by David Vela and others, they have discovered that a young American Latino woman so desired to serve in the Civil War that she disguised herself as a man and fought in multiple conflicts. Now, if you can think of the relevancy of that to today in the military and a variety of others, it's a perfect opportunity for young students in school today to learn that that is part of their legacy. A call to action acknowledges that one trip to a national park is just not enough. In an action called Step by Step, we are working with partners to create deep connections through a progression of experience for 10,000 kids a year which will offer educational programs, volunteer opportunities, and ultimately maybe even employment someday. Through actions called History Lessons and Next Generation Stewards, we will foster a new generation of citizen scientists, historians, and future stewards through hands-on biodiversity and history, history discovery events in at least 100 parks. We are also part of a growing movement that is worldwide working with health care providers to show how national parks and all open space are important but often looked as a variable in the public health equation. Simply taking an hour-long walk in a natural environment can bring about a drop in blood pressure and heart rate because the immediate relaxation of your experience. There can be an increase in white blood cell count, a reduction in stress hormones, and a boost to the immune system. A call to action recognizes the enormous potential that parks and protected lands have a, are a source for public health. We call this action, take a hike and call me in the morning. The National Park Service is the U.S. leader in the Healthy Parks, Healthy People and international movement that brings the outdoors into the discussion of public health and recognizing there is a growing body of evidence that suggests that human health is directly linked to the health of the natural world. In February, we'll be back here at Clemson for a workshop that we are co-sponsoring that will bring together scientists and public health experts to help craft a National Park Service plan to guide our research for healthy parks and healthy people. The First Lady 
Michelle Obama launched an initiative called Let's Move, which is fighting childhood obesity by encouraging exercise and good nutrition. For us in the national parks, we've got the exercise piece down, but we don't have the good nutrition down. Alice Waters, the mother of California cuisine, once said she never had a good meal in a national park. So with apologies to Spock, we are calling this action Eat Well and Prosper. This advocates that our concessioners will provide to visitors nutritious, locally grown food that will not only encourage healthy eating habits, but the food will become part of the National Park experience. And a group of actions called Parks for People in My Backyard and Follow the Flow, we are recognizing, perhaps for the very first time in my memory, that the National Park Service actually has a body of programs, authorities, and responsibilities that extend well beyond the traditional 395 park units that we manage and directly into communities. Our Rivers, Trails, and Conservation Assistance Program has been in existence for 45 years and frankly toiled in somewhat obscurity, but they have a long record of successfully helping communities develop trail systems, restore riverfronts, and connect people to these open spaces. A call to action amplifies this work by targeting at least 50 communities across the country with the least access to parks, committing every urban national park to improving access through a physical connection to public transportation or bike paths and establishing a national system of water trails, also known as blue ways. Those are just a few under the Connecting the People. Under advancing the National Park Service education mission, I believe that the national parks are our nation's most underutilized classrooms. They are unequaled in their ability to teach not just about the past, but about today. They are the biggest real world science laboratories on the planet and eyewitnesses to American history. In a series of actions like Live and Learn and A Class Act, we will use urban parks, battlefields, monuments, and historic homes to form a rich syllabus in civics and the humanities. Places like Manzanar, Little Rock Central High, Ellis Island, and Lowell, Massachusetts provide the opportunity to explore topics like human rights, labor, immigration, and a host of other subjects that are relevant now and today in our society. From the hall where independence was proclaimed in 1776 to a camp where Japanese Americans were rounded up and confined during World War II, to the workshop where the greatest inventor before Steve Jobs created the light bulb. National parks are where our next generation is inspired. I've heard directly from E.O. Wilson that encounters with ant hills in Rock Creek Park inspired him to become one of our greatest biologists. And I heard just this week that a recent recipient of the President's Gold Medal for Science awarded for his pioneering work on the structure of DNA, gained his inspiration from the geological hoodoos in Bryce Canyon. Evidence shows that kids who participate in place-based learning, like history and environmental programs in the national parks, tend to retain more information, do better on tests, show more enthusiasm about the subject matter, and we are therefore taking action called a ticket to ride with our National Park Foundation and other park philanthropic partners to provide transportation for 100,000 kids to visit national parks each year. To reach new audiences and engage in a conversation with all Americans, and I'll, I'll digress for a second. When I was meeting with the 20 sessions of young people, they said, well, what we really want is wireless in the backcountry. <laughs> and so we are going digital and we'll transform our digital experience in the national parks through a variety of user-friendly web platforms that will allow content to be raised to tablets, phones, or whatever they invent next. Preserving America's special places. When George Hartsog took over from the director's job from Connie Worth in 1964, he had on his desk a fresh copy of the Leopold Report. It was a rec set of recommendations from a group of scientists and scholars who called upon the National Park Service to use science to manage for natural processes in order to create what they called vignettes of primitive America. 
That 1963 Leopold Report has been the basis for our resource management policies for a half a century. It is time to revisit Leopold and incorporate the recognition of climate change, the impact Native Americans on our ecology, cultural resources, and the role humans now play in the world environment. In the action Revisit Leopold, preeminent scientists led by Dr. Rita Colwell and Dr. Tom Lovejoy, and assisted by our National Park Service Science Advisor, Dr. Gary Macklis, they will take a year to provide a new report on August 25th of 2012 that I hope will set the new foundation for resource management for the next one half century. In the action Go Green, we task our parks to reduce our carbon footprint, to use less energy and less water, produce less waste. These actions commit us to double the amount of renewable energy being used and generated within parks to sh and to talk about it with the public. In the action What's Old is New, we are demonstrating also how to do sustainability in historic structures. There's a great deal of embedded en energy in these fantastic facilities. We are also rethinking the whole concept behind the visitor center. In partnership with the Van Allen Institute, we've invited student and faculty teams from colleges across the country to reimagine national park design and how 21st century technologies can be used to meet visitor expectations and enhance the experience. I encourage the faculty and students at Clemson to consider applying for this program uh, deadline to November 1st, so get on it. Professional and organizational excellence. In our second century, the National Park Service will need a workforce that can adapt to continuous change, think systemically, evaluate risk, make decisions based on the best available sound science, understand the ac and be accurate to the fidelity of law, and act in the long-term public interest. We will use scholarship, work collaboratively with communities, and maintain our characteristic esprit de corps in the face of these new challenges. To do this, we are developing a career academy um, called Tools of the Trade. Now, I've known, having worked for the service for 35 years, that we can be very creative and very innovative at the local park level or within our variety of programs. There is a great sense of mission and with very little funding, creativity seems to emerge. But I've also learned that Washington is the place that good ideas come to die. <laughs> so in order to create the environment where innovation and creativity can be embraced, nourished and honored, and rise and survive, we have established the action called Destination Innovation, where we can accelerate the spread of good ideas. And the Open Park Grid is a perfect example of that. And inspire peer-to-peer -peer collaboration through a network of innovation and creativity that will address mission-critical problems. Though George Hartzog really began the work on diversity, I do not believe we have made much progress. So if the action value diversity, where we are recommitting to the workforce that reflects the face of America by valuing diversity and an inclusive work environment and recruiting and retaining a broad cross-section of diverse employees. Our second century finds the National Park Service and our many partners at a pivotal moment. As in the Hartzog era, there is a sense of urgency conviction that action is required if the national parks are to be relevant, if they are to survive in good stead in a different world than the one that created them. Since its creation in 1916, the National Park Service, like any new organization, has grown, learned, and adapted. At the dawn of the second century, we must continue the best traditions of the previous, but success in the coming century will require a reevaluation of what we do and how we do it. It will mean change and an expanded and more strategic focus to earn our relevance to the American people. A call to action is a start of our adaptation to the demands of this new world. There are many things that divide us as a nation, socioeconomic status, political leanings, religion, ethnicity, and income. But the idea behind the National Park Service can unite Americans in a sense of wonder 
and pride in our country. Our mission is truly unique among government agencies. As the stewards of the national experience, the keepers of our cultural memory, we can use the power and place of the National Park Service to ensure that everyone knows what it means to be an American. This is not only an honor, but a responsibility. The social challenges we face as a nation require the action of informed, engaged, and open-minded adults. For guidance and inspiration, they can look to our national parks. Former Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor wrote, there's no better route to civic understanding than visiting our national parks. They're who we are and where we've been. Our goal is to present to the American people a vision of our work that speaks to their lives today. The national parks must be in the minds of coming generations as treasured and vital as they were to the generations that have sustained them. And the work of the National Park Service must continue to touch communities and improve people's lives. Our success in our next century depends on it. And in a way, the success of our country depends on the National Park Service achieving this higher calling. Thank you. Be glad to take some questions. Don't be shy. Oh, come on. Right over here. Well, we'd be glad to take a new appropriation to help out. Um, having served in the service uh, as long as I have and been a superintendent and a regional director, I know that every manager out there um, you know, fills up their day, fills up their work day, all of their employees completely. And there's very little room to wedge in anything new. Um, but there's always a little bit of discretion about what the priorities are. That and this is really an intent to develop a strategic set of priorities for the service. We know that you know, parks across the system are engaging at community level. We know parks are bringing kids to uh, the schools. Um, we know that, for instance, a, a great uh, sort of point here is about our digital approach. Parks have been experimenting with all kinds of platforms out there, new applications. And what we're telling them is to work on content. Don't try to get in front of the industry. The industry will leave you in the dust. Um, but just work on content. Develop that. Focus your efforts in that area. Um, and let the platforms just drive it outside. And so this is really a set of directional priorities for the service to use that little bit of dis discretion. Now, we are engaging in the philanthropic community uh, to significantly grow uh, the contributions, and to use our non-appropriated dollars as well more strategically. But we will be able to look back on this, and we will reevaluate it every year up to 2016 to say some of these things we just didn't work, and maybe some of them have ex really exceeded our expectations. So it's also designed, that's why you don't have printed copies, it's all online, gives us an opportunity to, to adjust it. But everything in there we ran through a field filter to say this is actually, it's, it's going to push us, but it's all achievable. In the back. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's going to be somewhat ge geographically dependent, 
you know, if you're uh, operating in the Bay Area of California, you probably have a lot more access to fresh produce than, you know, if you're in Baker, Nevada. Um, however, um, what's really interesting is our concessioners, and, you know, we have about 80 concessioners that operate, uh, you know, food and beverage uh, restaurants, uh, hotels in the national parks. They're private businesses. They operate under contracts with us. And they are recognizing that providing healthy, locally grown food is a marketing opportunity for them to draw people in for um, – because, you know, they're, they're suffering under the same kind of economic constraints as we are. And um, I was recently in Olympic National Park just last weekend. Um, Aramark is our concessioner up there, and they provided dinner. And 70 percent of the food came from the Olympic Peninsula. Um, and it was fantastic, uh, you know, fresh fish, uh, fresh vegetables. And so uh, there, there really is an opportunity here. And frankly, there's a broader movement going on in school foods and a whole. So I think uh, we, we actually, um, the White House is hosting a uh, meeting on this um, a week from Monday uh, to bring a variety of the businesses together to talk about how we can work with both agriculture, local farms, distribution systems, uh, certification, um, and then the suppliers at the, at the end of the chain. And I think the Park Service can be a stimulus for that, and I think the state park systems out there are ready to jump on board as well. Right here. Good question. Um, obviously, climate change is a very, very complex issue, um, and um, the National Park Service is addressing it front on. Uh, we have uh, developed a, a climate change adaptation strategy. It has a, a number of components to it. Uh, the one that, in particular, that you're mentioning about landscape scale conservation, I think if you talk to any climate scientist out there, uh, that's concerned about the future and particularly migratory wildlife, it's all about connectivity. Um, how can we take what we have today, which the, let's just take the United States, for instance, and that it was divvied up uh, into blocks, whether it's protected areas or private lands or Indian reservations or military reservations or cities or all of that stuff, without any sort of overlay of ecological connectivity. But there are opportunities to fix that. And we have the analytical power now to do that, uh, and we are engaging in that uh, in the Department of Interior, taking the lead. For the very first time in, in my history, um, the four principal land management agencies, the Forest Service, the BLM, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Park Service were brought together to develop a land acquisition plan uh, at the landscape scale, all of us willing to give up a, a portion of our own little siloed programs towards saying what are the most critical pieces of habitat that we could acquire and who's got the authority. Maybe it's not a full fee acquisition. Maybe it's just a conservation easement. Maybe you keep it in a working landscape, but it has an ecological overlay to allow species to move because we know that some species are going to be driven, you know, north or south or whatever based on uh, climate change. Some species are going to go up and have no place to go. Um, we do also realize, though, that we need to build in as much resilience into these systems as we can because the, essentially climate change will force us through an ecological bottleneck of some form. And we want to come out on the other side with as many species left as possible. And so these refugias, like the Everglades, so some people question, well, sea level rise, why are you restoring the Everglades? Well, there are a variety of reasons we're putting effort into the Everglades. Fresh water for southern Florida, one of those. Um, but also by, by putting effort into restoring the natural systems. Natural systems, even though they're being driven anthropogenically, have a great deal of resilience. And so we are restoring systems across the country. We're looking for redundancies in the systems. I think the concept behind we need only to protect one of each is probably a dated idea. 
Um, but we also need to be really smarter about how big some of these things are. And they may not be as, as you know, be able to protect the whole thing, but if you protect the most critical parts, um, then you can build in some overall resilience to the system. You know, the Park Service, you know, we could reduce our, reduce our carbon footprint to zero and probably have a, a negligible effect. But we have a unique position in the American psyche and, and in the world. They look to us for leadership and they want to know the truth as, as we know it. And so we have a great educational responsibility, I believe, to talk about climate change. We are seeing the effects of climate change in our national parks right now. It's real, it's here. And there's no doubt about it. Now you can have a debate at the political level, but the scientific community is there and we see it today. And I think the opportunity to tell those stories uh, on the ground in our national parks is one of our responsibilities. Um, sure. Uh, Ron asked, what are we doing internationally? Um, the Park Service has always been looked upon as a leader internationally in the world, world parks community. Um, and um, uh, I recently uh, assigned a full-time position to IUCN to help prepare for the World Parks Congress, uh, which will be in 2014 in Australia. Um, I recently uh, hosted or co-hosted uh, a meeting of the World Protected Area Leaders Forum. And this is a great little group. I have to tell you a few anecdotes. The, uh, this is a group of, uh, of about 15 park directors uh, from around the world, South Africa, Kenya, Australia, New Zealand, Mexico, Colombia, um, and others. And uh, we sit around and we tell stories. We don't have any staff. we just directors. And we tell and commiserate on the challenges we're facing. And it's really funny sometimes to hear uh, their issues, and uh, you just sort of scratch your head. So like uh, David uh, Mabunda, the director of national parks in South Africa, said, well, I have this village right on the edge of the park, and they build their houses out of grass, and the elephants come out and eat their houses. <laughs> it's like, I don't have that problem. <laughs> yeah, nothing quite like that. Uh, he was also telling that uh, in Johannesburg, uh, the baboons, um, have um, uh, that come out of Table Mountain National Park uh, into the town have figured out that people want to take their picture. And so the people get out and the baboons walk up to them and lean into them <laughs> to get their picture taken. And then once you, they know when the picture's taken and then they go, okay, pay me. And essentially, they want a handout uh, for having their picture taken. Um, and if you don't give it to them, you're really in trouble. <laughs> Baboons are big and strong. Um, so we are providing a lot of technical assistance around the world in South Korea, in China, in Cambodia, uh, in Saudi Arabia, in Afghanistan. Um, we are helping uh, countries develop their own park systems. Um, and, um, and it's a fantastic opportunity for the students in the room uh, the World Parks community is a fantastic community to get involved with. Um, they're doing amazing things. We learn as much uh, from them um, as we uh, provide in terms of technical assistance to, uh, to countries around the world. Right back there. Absolutely. Um, actually, I think the pioneering work that's happening here at, at Clemson with the Open Park Grid is a perfect example of the parks community working together. And I know I've worked uh, directly with Ruth and the National Association of State Park Directors and the National Association of State Liaison Officers and uh, NRPA uh, as a parks community. We are really in this together. And um, so if you sort of read between the lines in terms of the call to action, it really is about the entire parks community. The Park Service has kind of a unique role in that we're, you know, we're fairly well funded, we're highly visible, 
Uh, and we have a great deal of support uh, from the U.S. Congress and from the President, regardless of their party affiliation. And that's an opportunity to, to be at the point of the spear and help drive innovation and creativity and to reposition, frankly, the parks in the American social fabric. I spoke to that earlier at lunch, is that I think, for instance, this issue of public health could be a game changer for us. I mean, think about you know, how many commercials you've seen on television for some new uh, medicine. And think about having a commercial that says, you know, FDA just released uh, their research results on this new antidote to cancer and obesity and, and depression and heart disease. And oh, by the way, it's free and it's available in your local community and it's parks. That's exactly what's going on in Australia right now. They've been at this for about 10 years. And in Australia, they are now receiving 1% of the profits from the insurance industry into the park systems. Um, and so they're on a growth spurt uh, because the medical community uh, has recognized that an investment in parks, in access, in information, in safe parks, in trails, is, will save them money down the road, the insurance industry in particular. So I think this is a huge game changer for us. Uh, it is a world movement, um, and um, as a matter of fact, I am I'm speaking to the American Association of Public Health uh, Officers uh, next week, and I'm speaking to the AMA uh, Thursday, and I spoke to a room about this size at Harvard at their medical school uh, in, uh, in this past year, all about this issue, uh, really hoping to, one, inspire a deeper body of quant of quantitative, you know, longitudinal studies, because there's still some skepticism out there about this. Uh, we hosted a uh, listening session in Chicago with Health and Human Services, and the chief medical officer of Health and Human Services stood up here. I was on a panel, and she opened it with saying, I'm not so sure the outdoors is all that good for you. She said, when you think about all those bugs and the places to fall down, and, uh, you know, there are snakes out there, and you might get sunburnt, uh, all those things that maybe exercise indoors is actually better for you. And she said, we'll wait to see what the evidence says. Now, those of us in the parks community can say, oh, yeah, right, okay, we know it. But the medical community needs to see the science. They need to see the research that actually shows that. And as a matter of fact, I just got on my BlackBerry this morning a report coming out of uh, the, the American Ophthalmology Society report on that they've, they've, through longitudinal studies, determined that for children, being outdoors can help them with nearsightedness because they see things at a distance, and it actually improves this. Just being outside makes that difference. So if we can begin to build our community around these concepts, around the idea that the outdoors are actually good for you for all the things that ill, that, uh, um, have, we have problems with, and we now spend 18% of the gross national product on, on medical um, services in this country, that's a game changer for us. What else? Right there. Um, I'm not sure what your question is, but well, in the cases of Yellowstone, um, you know, we did we actually had two fatalities, and we did kill that bear. Um, uh, the uh, this last year, after we discovered she was involved in both of those fatalities. Um, the, um, you know, the Park Service takes the position in terms of dealing with, you know, migratory species, large animals, charismatic megafauna, if you, if you might, bears, wolves, bison, as part of the experience. The last thing we want to do is sanitize it for the American public. Um, 
we want you to be able to experience that. And there are risks. Actually, risk is part of the experience, whether you're rafting a river or rappelling off a cliff or sleeping on the ground in grizzly country. Um, that's part of the experience. And uh, our job is to educate the public as much as possible about those risks, but certainly not deny you the opportunity to experience them. And um, when someone loses their life in our national parks, it, uh, it's tragic, breaks my heart every time. Uh, I, I, I learn about it, um, and I want to understand why, um, and, uh, and try to do what we can do to prevent it in the future. Uh, but it's not to take it out on the animals. Um, it's to provide that extraordinary experience. I was in Yellowstone about a week after that first fatality in the backcountry myself um, and had the experience uh, that will rank right up there in some of my top experiences in the parks. I was hiking out of the backcountry, coming down a steep hill with my son. We'd been in the backcountry for about four days uh, fly fishing. And... Um, we heard this rumble coming behind us, this just powerful rumble. It's a little bit forested and pretty rolling landscape. And over the hill came about 150 bison on a dead run. Um, and, um, and they were, you know, probably 25 yards from us when they came over the top of the hill, something driving them, probably a bear. And, um, and so we just stepped behind a boulder, and the boulder was about maybe three times the size of this... Uh, this podium in about that high and we just stood there and they parted like water around us um, and you know I could have stuck up my hand and ran my fingers through their hair as they went by uh, and as they came around you know, that big brown eye kind of looked at you and jumped you know <laughs> like who who was that you know and uh, um, the ability to have that kind of experience in the United States today is really, in many ways, what it's all about. Um, it's all about having that opportunity to, to go away with that kind of life-changing experience. What else? In the very back. Oh, absolutely. Um, we host about 60 million foreign visitors a year, and from an economic standpoint, that's new money coming into the system. It's not just displacement, but it's actually real dollars. Um, and, uh, and it's a significant contribution, billions of dollars to the American economy. So uh, we are working. Um, they recently hired a new uh, tourism promotion director with the State Department and the Department of Commerce to specifically promote America as a tourist destination, and specifically the national parks. And uh, so we are working with them, our hospitality association, uh, to really work on marketing materials, uh, information. I mean, the new uh, uh, Asia is really starting to come to the United States, more and more Chinese coming to the U.S. And there are landscapes we have here in this country that cannot be found anywhere else in the world. And um, so I think it's a great marketing opportunity. It provides jobs. It helps uh, local gateway communities uh, as well. So we, uh, uh, we're always challenged with the weakness of the dollar and transportation and 9-11 and all those kinds of things that add layers, but we still believe um, that we provide an extraordinary experience for international visitors. Right here. Good question. You know, in the, I think similarly, if we link it back to the George Hartzog era, and, you know, George uh, recognized that we had a need to connect to all Americans, and he put a great deal of investment in what was called Mission 66, which was the development of an infrastructure in the system of roads, visitor centers, campgrounds, uh, picnic areas, and all of that to accommodate the American public uh, and the foreign public as they were coming. That, that infrastructure today, we're still dealing with, to a certain degree, its legacy and its challenge. That's why we have a $10 billion maintenance backlog. 
Um, I think in terms of visitors, first of all, um, with all the, ch the challenges we have in front of our national parks in terms of impact from the arrival of exotic species and world transport of mercury and climate change and sea level rise, the impacts from direct in, the direct impacts from visitors is pretty small. Frankly, it's probably insignificant. Um, it, we need to rethink that. Now, we're also much better at managing the public than we were 20 or 30 years ago in terms of transportation systems. I think the, the opportunity for the Internet to allow people to plan their visit in a way that they don't result in all jamming through the entrance gate at the same time or at the same parking lot. Um, there's a, a real ability to provide real-time information just as you would make a decision about where you're going to visit someplace. I think that our opportunity is to upload that information, make real-time information available. We also have significantly invested in restoration of places that where in the past we built the public facilities right on top of the resource. We've pulled a lot of those out. You go to Sequoia National Park, all of the facilities have been pulled out of the giant sequoias. Um, that was a mistake to build it there. It was, you know, they didn't know it at the time. Uh, but we've restored that entire forest now and restored it both fire and other ecological indicators. But the public are still coming. They're driving on buses. They're getting off at parking lots that provide accommodation for those with disabilities. And, and um, so I think we're, we're better at it. We're not perfect. We're establishing, in some cases, carrying capacities uh, so that we have measurable standards and objectives so we know when we're really impacting the resource with, uh, with visitors. But frankly, I think that the bigger challenge in the long term is irrelevancy. And if we don't address it through direct contact, then ultimately the work that we do will, will truly be an artifact, and we will lose the constituency by which we exist. What else? One more, right back there. Um, uh, we've talked about it, um, <clears throat> uh, and as a matter of fact, I had somebody just recently uh, hit me up about that as well. Uh, certainly other countries do differential pricing. Uh, you know, if you're going to go uh, from the United States to, you know, go to South Africa or other parts of the world, uh, you're going to pay a pretty penny, much more than the local residents uh, pay as well. Um, we have not really seriously considered it at this point. Uh, I'm not a – at this point, the national park system is, is principally supported by the taxpayer dollars. And uh, we look at the fee programs only as a supplement to that. We, one good thing, if you don't know, is we actually get to keep our fees. They don't disappear into the, into the Treasury. They're actually 100 percent retained by the national park system, and we turn those right around into better services and better facilities. Um, but uh, to be blunt about it, we have not looked at that that type of, uh, you know, layering of, uh, of different fees. But we may have to. <laughs> it just seems that the parks are one of the best uh, entertainment fields around for people who are contributing to that tax base. It is, but I, what I don't want the national parks to ever become is only the destination of the wealthy and the elite that violates the basic concept upon which they were established. This Stegner's America's Best Idea, and as Ken Burns says, it's the Declaration of Independence applied to the land that anyone, regardless of their socioeconomic status or their ethnicity or their background, can stand shoulder to shoulder on the south rim of the Grand Canyon and enjoy it for the same price, and, uh, which is cheap. And uh, to, at least for as long as I'm director, we're going to try to keep it that way uh, so that all Americans can, uh, can enjoy their national parks. Thank you.